It is certainly good to see each and every one of you here this morning. We welcome those that are with us online as well. But I'm so thankful that uh, having a neighborhood of 100 folks sitting here before me right now, that we can open up our Bibles and see what God's Word has to say to us. We're going to be in 1 Peter chapter 2 this morning. We are going to be looking at uh, particularly verse 11 this morning. And here are some things that I want us to think about and some things that I want us to remind ourselves about. Here in uh, verse 11, it says, I urge you as aliens and strangers in the world. Now I want you to think about this morning whether or not you really are an alien and stranger in this world in which we live in. I look at the picture that we have on the wall and I think about old Abraham a long time ago getting up his camels and leaving. Uh, you look over the countryside as there, it's not where you'd want to make your home. I'm sure that he went through some territory that would have looked like that been a good place to settle down and make home. But his world was not his home and he kept traveling throughout the time. And we'll talk more about Abraham here in just a few minutes. As was read for us here just a few moments ago, there are several things that are going to be said about God's people, about Christians. Some of these that we think about and we're you know, pretty happy to think about them. A chosen people. God wants us. God wants Christians. God has decided before the world was ever created that Christians, those that are following His Son, that have faith in His Son, are going to have that heavenly home. A royal priesthood. We think about the priesthood that was underneath the old law. Well, in a very real sense, we as our priests here under the new law, and we are serving people around about us as well as those priests at that time. He says that Christians are a holy nation. They are a group of people that are wanting to do what God wants done, and that's around the world. It's not just in one small location, but around the world. There are people that form a nation of people that want to serve God and please God and have heaven as at home. He says that we are a people belonging to God. You know, that's music to our ears to know that, yes, we really do belong to God and that we are a people of God. But another phrase that I'm afraid that sometimes isn't quite the music to our ears is that we are aliens and strangers. And I would like for us to think about that this morning. Do you think of yourself in this world as an alien and as a stranger. Well, first of all, what is a, an alien? An alien is a temporary resident or traveler in a foreign country. Uh, you could use the word wanderer there. You could use the word sojourner there. The word stranger is a visitor that's making a brief stay. It is someone who doesn't belong. You could use the word pilgrim right there. So sojourners and pilgrims is also used there in some translations. I'd ask you this morning, have you ever traveled to a foreign country? And what was it like being in that foreign country? Now all I can say for myself personally is I went on that bridge that went under the water from Michigan on into Canada and I might have spent about an hour in Canada many, many years ago before we came back into the United States. So didn't get to see much of what Canada was all about. But some of you have been, in fact, many of you here in this room have been to Mexico, help out with the city of children. You found a place entirely different than right here in Columbia, Tennessee. There are some of you have been to some of the islands and visited those. And again, you found something entirely different than right here. Some of you have been over into Europe and places like that, and you have gone there as a traveler and a visitor. And I want you to stop and to think about that particular experience. You were there to see things. You were there to enjoy things. It may have been the beauty of God's creation, or it may have been the architecture there, or maybe the historical things that you've seen down through the years. 
but the fact was always in your mind that I am here for so many days and then I am going home. Maybe it was a two-week trip, so after three days, you knew 11 more days, I'm going home. After 13 days, you know, tomorrow, I'm going home. And so there is that thought that was always in the back of your mind that I am going home. You really weren't interested in settling down there. You were there for the enjoyment of it. You were there to learn some things about the rest of the world that you didn't really know. You really weren't all that interested in fitting in all that well. You just wanted to see the things that were there. You were not interested in learning every detail of the culture. Now, you did want to know enough that you don't uh, look to be offensive to the people that are there. But you know that there's customs there, and you know that that's interesting to see how things are different there than they are here. But the fact is, you know you're going back home and going to do things like what you've always done. You're probably not even very interested in learning the language that's there. Now, you want to know a few things about ordering some food, and certainly you want to know the phrase, where's the restrooms at? But beyond that, you're still an American traveling, you're still speaking your English language, and you're thinking, I'm going home. I think about soldiers also, and I especially think about uh, pictures and videos that I saw when World War II was over. A soldier was commanded, you're going. And they are there, and everything that that commander tells them to do, they do. But there finally came that day when it was said, the war is over. And it still makes an impression on me today to see how there was dancing in the streets, that there was just so much joy and there was so much celebration. Why? Some of them have been two, three, four, five years fighting that war. Now that it's declared over, what does it mean? I'm going home. I'm going home. I'm going back to my life. I ask you this morning, do you feel that way about this life you are living right here? That you know that there is something better that God has in store for us, and that in reality that is home, and that's where I'm going. The scriptures are full of a lot of folks that you could say we're strangers in this world. Here's just a list. There's more that you could add to that. But I stop and I think about how Enoch is presented to us as a man that walked with God, and something very special because he walked with God. He was different than everyone else, and it just simply says that God took him. I think about the story of Noah that we looked at just very recently, and I think about how that as building that ark that there was a lot of mockery that took place, a lot of poking fun at him. They looked at him as a stranger. What's wrong with you? Why are you doing something like that? I'm sure there are people saying, what do you mean God told you to do something like this? But he stuck to what he was supposed to do, and he literally saw the world change around about him. We think about it. Abraham and Sarah that got that call to leave their country and to go to where God's going to lead them. So yes, they did get on those camels and they did travel. There was not one piece of ground that they could say was theirs. There's no doubt that they went in through a lot of different villages and run into caravans where people are speaking other languages. There is not one place that they could say, this is my home. You know, I'm thrilled to be able to say, here is my home. My home is on 877 Cawthorn Road in Columbia, Tennessee. If you want to get in contact with me, you'll find me there. Not once could Abraham say, well, a year from now, this is where I'll be. He didn't know where he was going, and he had nothing that he owned at all. I think about the woman by the name of Rebecca that a servant is sent out to find a wife for Isaac. And so he finds this woman and says to her father, I want to take her back home. What did that mean? She had to leave all that she knew as her home and travel these many, many miles to this new location 
And those became her people. Hadn't even met this man that's going to be her husband. But she made that decision, this will be my new home. I'm leaving it behind. Now think about Joseph. As Joseph was uh, carried off in, uh, to the Egypt, eventually ended up there in Egypt. You know how he rose to the top. But you know what? It never was home to him. How do we know that? Because he gave the instructions that when I die and when you leave here, you take my bones away from here. I don't want my bones to be left in this land. So yes, he was there, but that really wasn't his home. Now think about Moses as raised in the house of Pharaoh, had all the pleasures that were afforded to him because of the royalty that he was. And yet, what did he do? He turned his back on all those so that he might suffer a time with his people, the Israelites. Egypt wasn't his home. That's where he grew up, but it really wasn't his home. His heart was with his people, the Hebrews. We're all familiar with the story of Ruth, how that she's in her homeland, and yes, she marries this uh, Jewish boy, but that Jewish boy dies, her brother-in-law dies, her father-in-law dies, and her mother and law says, I'm going back home. And we know what Ruth says. You know, she's been living here, but she says, I'm going with you, and your people will be my people. She turned her back on her culture and her people, and she went to live with the people of God. I think about David down through the years of running from Saul. Where's home? Well, tonight it's in this cave. Tomorrow may be in another cave. And the next day, it might be just sleeping under the stars. But from location to location to location, for years after years after years, until finally he did become king and had the palace to call his own. And then I think about Daniel that's carried off as a young Jewish boy into captivity, and there in Babylon. Where's his heart at? What's his thoughts all about? It's about home. I don't think he ever got to go back home. But he would open up that east window and look towards Jerusalem and offer up prayers to God on a daily basis because that's where his heart was. So the scriptures are just full of individuals that yes, they lived in this world like a stranger in this world. In Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 13, we find this about Abraham And it is not only applied to Abraham, but there are many individuals previously. And so it's going to include those folks as well. And it says, all these people were still living by faith when they died. They did not receive the things promised. They only saw them and welcomed them from a distance. And they admitted that they were aliens and strangers on earth. I'm a foreigner. Yes, I'm right here on this planet, but I am a foreigner. I belong to God. Now, what did they mean when they said that? Well, I go back up to verse 10 in the same chapter. For he was looking forward to the city with foundations whose architect and builder is God. So as he is traveling through the desert, as he may go through some small cities and communities from here to there, as he may run into some caravans of people along the way, this is not going to be my home. I'm looking for a city that God is building. And it wasn't here. It wasn't here. We drop down to 14 through 16. People who say such things show that they are looking for a country of their own. If they had been thinking of the country they had left, they would have had opportunity to return. Instead, they were longing for a better country, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. Abraham knew that there is something special that God has prepared for me, and so by that faith he would leave that home and he would travel and wander throughout the entirety of his life. Because he was going to that city of God. I asked this morning, do you have that faith as well? This morning, are you willing to say, this world is not my home? There is a city that God has prepared for me, and that's where I'm going. That's where my home 
is going to be. Now a passage that you are familiar with along this line also is found in the book of Philippians chapter 3. And there's a phrase in there that each one of us must fully realize as best we can about our lives. That our citizenship is in heaven. That's what we are a citizen of. Yes, I can say that I'm a citizen of this city, this county, this state, this country. But the most important thing for me to say is that I am a citizen of heaven itself. And here's what the Apostle Paul said along that line. Join with others in following my example, brothers, and take note of those who live according to the pattern we gave you. But as I have told you before and now say again, even with tears, many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their destiny is destruction, and their God is their stomach, and their glory is in their shame, and their mind is on earthly things. I'm asking you to stop and to think today, could that possibly describe me? Am I more concerned about the things with my belly? No, we all know we have to eat. That's a fact of life. God has designed us in order to do that. But are we so interested in things of this world that we are not participating in spiritual things? Are the spiritual things more important to us than the physical things? It says their mind is on earthly things. Let's stop and think about where the vast majority of our thinking goes on a day-by-day basis. It's probably on physical things, earthly things. How much of our time is devoted to spiritual things? In verse 20, he makes this famous statement, but our, who's our? That's Christians. Our citizenship is in heaven. And we eagerly, await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ. Do we keep our eye on the sky for His return? Are we eagerly wanting to be with Him? You see, that's what he says a Christian life is all about. We belong in heaven. We want to be with Jesus Christ. We want to be with the Heavenly Father. We want to be in heaven. That's our home. We eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enables Him to bring everything under His control will transform our lowly bodies so they'll be like His glorious body. Oh, there are changes that's going to take place, but there is that place that God has prepared for us. When Jesus left this earth, one of the last things He said is that I'm going to prepare a place for you. The place is there. That's really our home. Is that how we think on a daily basis? Romans chapter 12 and verse 2 tells us this. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Christians are supposed to be different. Somehow down through the centuries here in this country, We've got the impression that we've got to fit in in every way imaginable. And that's not the case. Our thinking, our actions, our deeds, whatever we are all about is to really be so much different than the world. And that's one of the ways that we ought to be making an impact on this world. But far too often that is not the case. Have you changed your thinking since the time that you have become a Christian? And then I would ask you, as you have spent time as a Christian, are you growing so that more and more you think about spiritual things and longing for that spiritual home? You know, there's a lot of things going on in the world around about us now that in many ways helps us realize that this world is not our home, helps us realize in a lot of different ways it just don't really fit in very well. I stop and think about the terrorism we see around the world and even see here in our own country, Uh, especially thinking about the the riots, the lootings, the burning, the destruction that we've seen in the months that's gone by. 
It's just not right. How can we do that to ourselves? It makes me realize that that's not what I want to see. That's not what I want to be a part of. That's not what this country is about. You see mass shootings been going on for several years now, and you think, why? How can someone think like that? How can someone do something like that? It's because they have a lot different thinking than what we do. We see in just recent months how there's a lot of children has been rescued from a sex trafficking situation. And again, we ask ourselves, how can people do such a thing to a small child? Sometimes less than a year old. Small children, two, three, four, five, being abused that way. How can people do such things? It's beyond our imagination. We think about the drug abuse and the alcohol abuse, and we think about how uh, divorce has changed our nation so much. We just see so much meanness and helps us to realize that this world is not my home. It's not. You know, all these things I'm talking about is not going to be a part of heaven. One of the beauties of heaven itself is that there will be absolutely no evil there whatsoever. There won't be the headlines like what you and I are accustomed to reading or seeing in this day and time. What a wonderful place it's going to be. But I suppose as much as anything else, as bad as all those other things are, it seems like we are coming to a point that we are a loveless society. Don't care about our fellow man. And how different that is for God's people. In James chapter 4, we find a passage that is spoken to us. And it ties in with the second half of our verse. We are to live as aliens and strangers, which means we must do what? abstain from sinful desires which war against your soul. So as we talked about the World War II soldier a little while ago, he was in that situation because of a war. And the fact is that you and I are in the situations that we are in because of a war. A war with good and evil fighting one another. So James says this to us in the fourth chapter in verse 4. Speaking to God's people, you adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world is hatred towards God? Did you hear that? Friendship with the world is hatred towards God. If anyone chooses to be a friend of the world, then he becomes an enemy of God. Are we a friend of God? Or are we an enemy of God? A lot of it has to do with how we see this world in which we are a part of. Well, we are to be aliens. What, what do we mean when we are aliens? A few things, there's probably a lot more that we could say, but a few things, we have a different outlook on life. I ran across a quote from Howard Hendricks this week that I liked real well. It says, most people think that they're in the land of the living, heading towards the land of the dead. You know, we're alive, but there comes that day that we die. He said, the truth is, we are in the land of the dying, headed to the land of the living. Do you believe that? Do you understand that? That our death will take place here in this world, but we as God's people are going to a place where we never will die, where there is eternal life. We have different values. We ought to have values of honesty, integrity, and holiness, and love, and kindness. I think about in 1 Peter chapter 3, in verses 3 and 4, where he's speaking to ladies whose uh, husbands were not Christians, but they were. And he says, it's not all about how you dress. And he's saying to them, do not 
seek all the finery as far as the outside is concerned, but you live a holy life, you live a good life, you live a reverent life, so that as they see how you are living your life, that they can be influenced. It's not about the outside, and that's what much of this world is about. It's about making your inside as good as you possibly can. We are to have a different vocabulary than what the world does have. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 29 says that there is to be no unwholesome talk comes out of your mouth. That's not the way of the world. No unwholesome talk come out of your mouth, but only that which is beneficial to building others up. You drop down a little further in the scripture, the fifth chapter, verse 4, says that there is to be no obscenity, no foolish talk, no coarse joking. These things are out of place for God's people. But yet you hear these things all around about us. Yes, our vocabulary is to be different. How we use money is to be much different than the world. In Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 5, we are told to keep our lives free from the love of money. We are shown how to be generous to people, how we are to be giving to God and His work. We are to do things different than what the world does. We are to treat people fairly and rightly when it comes to the realm of money. We are to be different as far as sexual morals are concerned. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 18 through 20, it talks about the fact there to begin with that we are to flee sexual immorality. Well, what is sexual morality? That is a husband and a wife, and then after they become husband and wife, then enjoy the sexual relationship that God has developed. Outside of that, it's immoral. It's wrong. And that's not what we hear in this world around about us, but that's what God's people know that God's word does say. That passage finishes up by saying, honor God with your body. Not only from the sexual standpoint, but every standpoint. Are we honoring God with our body? That's how we're different than the world around about us. And there is a different use of our time. How do we use our time? The vast majority of Columbia is not sitting in a building worshiping God this morning. We all should be. He's the creator of us all. We need to be worshiping God. We need to be seeking how that we can do good to help our fellow man. Giving of our time. Galatians chapter 5 and verse 13 tells us to serve one another in love. That's how we're different. So that's just a few things that I have listed for you. But the Christian life is to be so much different, is it, in our life. This morning I want us to know that God is on His throne. There's a lot of things going on in the world around about us that's troubling to us as God's people. But God is on His throne and we should never forget that. I know that there are a lot of concerns in this day and time still uh, about this virus that's going around, but I want you to realize that you know, we do what we can. We stay away from it as much as we can. We protect ourselves as much as we can, but the fact is we're going to worship God. We're going to do what's necessary in order to please Him in every aspect of our life. And as for me, I say, if it takes me, it takes me. I want us to know and to realize that when we leave this world, we're going to that heavenly home. I hope you're looking forward to that. There is a tremendous amount of emotions tied in with our election that's coming up in just a few days. But I want you to know this. This world is not our home. No matter how it might turn out, whether it is what you want or is not what you want, God's still on his throne. This world's not our home. We're headed towards heaven itself. This morning, I want to conclude with 1 John chapter 4, verses 4 through 6. You, dear children, are from God and have overcome them. 
because the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. Yes, there is that battle that's taking place. But as God's people, God lives in us and Christ lives in us and we can overcome. Are you striving to do that? The one that is in you is greater than the one in the world. That's Satan. They, these people he's been referring to, are of the world and therefore speak from the viewpoint of the world and the world listens to them. John says, we are from God, and whoever knows God listens to us, but whoever is not from God does not listen to us. And this is how we recognize the spirit of truth and the spirit of falsehood. So who are we listening to? Are we listening to the world, or are we listening to God? We're going to stand and sing the invitation song here in just a moment. And I've asked, this world is not my home to be sung as an invitation song, not one we normally do. But I want you to think about the words as we sing that. And if you really, truly can't honestly say that, will you not make changes in your life today? If you know you're not a Christian, then you know that you're not headed to that heavenly home yet. Why not make that change? And maybe as a Christian, you've fallen in love with the world and you're doing the things of the world instead of what God wants you to do. Why not make that change? Let's live our lives as aliens and strangers, as pilgrims and sojourners in this world.